Okay, I wanna go ahead and get started because we have a lot of great questions um, from our students. So let's go ahead and get started. It's great to see a wide representation from our schools, Miami-Dade and Orange County Public Schools um, that are interested in learning the business side of the sports industry. Thank you for joining us. My name is Soleil Gonzalez and I am a Director of Corporate Relations and Engagement at NAF. We're really excited to be able to present to you Sports Arena Operations featuring the Miami Heat. But before we get started with introductions, I'd like to remind you once again, please make sure that your audio is set to mute. Your cameras can be turned off for now, but towards the end, I will ask you to please turn on your cameras so we can take some screenshots. Once again, this is being recorded. So please be mindful of any comments that you put in the chat. NAF would like to thank the Miami Heat organization for allowing close to 100 students the opportunity to hear from an executive about her career journey to sports operations, sports arena operations. And I can go on and on talking a little bit about the heat or introducing her, but I think it's a lot better when um, our presenters introduce themselves. So I would like to ask our panelists if she would kick things off with a quick introduction. Thank you, Soleil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamona Haling. I am the manager of facility services here at the American Airlines Arena for the Miami Heat Group. Um, I work in the operations and engineering division of our company. A little bit about how I got here. So uh, for undergrad, I actually studied legal studies and sports management. I wanted to go to law school to be an agent, but um, somehow I took a hard beeline to actually working for a team. Um, when I started with the Heat, I actually started in the box office part-time to get a feel for what it meant to actually work for an organization and work at the arena. And uh, after two and a half years of the, working in the box office, I started working with the event services department and guest services department. I would coordinate small events, uh, work uh, backstage at all of our major concerts that we had here, doing everything from the dressing room coordination to VIP party coordination, and then, uh, the, the loadout, making sure that the show loads everything out so we can get ready for basketball the next day. The guest services side, I worked with staffing. I was the staffing manager, meaning I was the manager on duty that night for all of our ticket takers, our guest services staff, ensuring that we, everybody's uh, entry into the building was smooth, all guest relations were smooth, any issues that night were taken care of. And last summer, I transitioned to the operations and engineering department because um, I've always had a love for the technical side and operational side of the business and working with the engineering and operations department allows me to work with all of our building automation systems, uh, digitizing the department basically from the ground up, making everything seamless for our engineers and also for ourselves if we can literally control the building from our homes at this point. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know what the future holds here with the heat, but I actually really love what I do. And that is it in a nutshell, my journey. Thank you, Jamona. That was a great introduction and segue to the first question, um, which was, you know, how did you end up working for the engineering and operations division? Like, did you talked about having more of a sports management, sports operation background, like what are some of the technical skills like that required to work in your department? Um, well, some of the technical skills that require to work in the department, we have um, two electricians on staff. We have five or six engineers on staff. We have three HVAC guys. And then we have somebody that specializes in uh, the motherboards and the, the actual hardware of all of our technology here. He's kind of the, the brain source. So if something goes down, we're asking him to, to pull it open and, hey, do we, is this motherboard fried? Do we need to order a new processor? What do we need to do for this? Um, and then from my end, why I was brought in is because I, again, I had a love for the technical side of things. And, and I've worked on, um, we're working on a global calendar software, which basically digitized our entire building all of our blueprints and put it into one platform. So you can go through and book uh, various rooms for meetings. We can book the arena for 
uh, the various events that we have and everybody can see, okay, these areas are locked down for the day. These areas are, what are gonna be in use for the, for the day or for this event. Uh, so I started there and then I kind of segued because I, I learned the lay of the land from doing that, from working with the blueprints in the building to being more interested in how can we do things like uh, digitize our energy consumption so we can see the dashboard from the palm of our hand. So I guess an understanding of the capabilities of technology and the willingness to um, grow the department is a requirement for my position, but for the engineering department specifically, you have to be a licensed like electrician, engineer, you have to have a plumbing background, et cetera, and be able to, because they, they handle everything on a, a game day, on an event day, on a dark day when there's nobody in the building, but something's breaking down. It is a 20 year old facility. So it does require a lot of upkeep. I find that very interesting because you mentioned several careers just within one department, right? You mentioned programming, you mentioned engineering, you mentioned um, uh, management, project management. Um, and so oftentimes people assume that because it's a sports arena or it's a sports team that it's really just focused on sports, but there are so many different career options, even within your department alone. And we'll go into that a little bit more in a few minutes. But the next question is, you mentioned that you have worked both in the front of the house and in the back of the house at the heat or at the heat sports arena, triple A. Could you differentiate a little bit for our students? What's the difference between what is considered the front of the house at the um, sports arena, triple A and what's considered the back of the house? So the front of the house would be uh, any de department that interfaces with the guests. So guest services, the ticket takers, um, parking, valet, our food and beverage. Those people are front of house because they see the guests that come in um, on, a, on a game day basis, on an event basis. Whereas back of the house are the people that are basically the, the gears. Think of them as the gears that are making everything run. So the people that you don't see that, that are handling the lighting, that are making sure that backstage, the dressing rooms are set, uh, making sure that the food is catered for backstage. Because we have food and beverage for front of house and we have food and beverage for um, back of house. And then back of house, they, take on the day-to-day -day operations. Front of house is just there when we need to turn it on for events, um, for games. Retail will also be considered uh, front of house, but then there's back of house retail operations, the people in the warehouse that you don't see that are fulfilling the orders, um, the people that are that are buying from new new vendors to get the you know new jackets or the new vice shorts or, or whatever it may be. Those people are back of house operations. So is marketing because they're putting together all the graphics that we need for the games. Uh, so there are, I would say very, there are people that work the front of house, but more operationally, we everything happens back of house because there's a lot of stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes that people don't get to see to make every, to make the magic happen, if you will. Very neat. Now, you, you have mentioned both events, you've mentioned concerts, you've mentioned games. I will pull up a poll because I'm interested to see how many of our students have actually attended either a concert or a, or a game. So for those of you that are on, there's gonna be a poll that comes up. You just simply answer yes or no. Have you ever attended a game or a concert at the AAA? And this is interesting, right? Because as Jamona is explaining some of the operations that happens behind the scenes, for those of you that have attended a concert or an event, some of those special effects, some of the cool um, screens that you see as you're walking through the stadiums, that all kind of seems to come out of your department. Is that correct, Jamona? Well, actually that comes out of several, several divisions. So the unique thing about the Ops and Engineering Department is that we have a hand in, in all of the stuff that actually goes on. For example, if we install a new uh, screen at the front entrance, that, that comes through my department in the sense that we have to facilitate the installation and facilitate the power, et cetera, to that. So we have a lot of hands in all of those projects, but the graphics that you see on there would be broadcast, um, actually making sure the display works or marketing, making sure that the graphics that are supposed to be on that are queued up and we're running the right sponsor ads, et cetera. Um, but like I said, the unique thing is we have hands in a lot of those, which is comes into the project management side. When we break it down, I probably have the most project projects in the building because everything has to run through us because we are basically the backbone of anything that, that happens in the arena. 
Thank you for that. One of your main roles is managing and implementing the HEATS digital assets, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain to our students what are digital assets and what sets the HEAT organization apart from maybe other sports team in that space? So our digital assets, um, they vary. So for, for the operations and engineering uh, side of it, it's our, our building op uh, automation platform that we have, which basically, like I mentioned earlier, we can turn on the building from home. You can turn on the lights, you can turn on the air from home, uh, security can watch the cameras from home. All of those aspects go into one, one platform. So managing that and making sure that we're kind of staying ahead of the times in terms of what data we get on that platform. If we're, we're able to see what our energy consumption is every 15 minutes on that platform, what we're spending in chill water and to, or what we're consuming in chill water, which pumps our, our air conditioning units in the building. We can also see what we're, what we're using in, in gas on a show day and on a, a dark day. So we, the, the importance of that system and the importance of the functionality of that system is so that we can understand as the building ages, what the trends are in our consumption. And also during this time where everything's pretty much shut down because of COVID, we kind of get a raw look at what we're using as opposed to what we're not using. Uh, we also have in our, our digital access, we have a, a platform called Power BI which shows us our entry times, um, which gates people are coming into most, uh, what concession stand they're buying most food from, and then also a new component, which I've been working on, is showing our executives what we are using in the same consumption of, of energy and, and water. So they can see that at the tip of their fingers and understand, okay, our energy bill has been slashed in half because of COVID. And then when we go back into shows, what do we do? What, what little things do we do in terms of like lighting controls to make sure that we can kind of keep it at a manageable level, even though we're going full events pretty soon, hopefully. Um, and I think that's an interesting point. Why would the heat want to track what entrance folks come in through? Like, why is that an important data set? Um, it's important for us so we understand how to staff the gate. So we can, we're breaking down staffing for security, we know all right, so gates, for those of you that have come to games before, the front gates are always slammed. But if for some reason um, the back gates get slammed, we know that we have to shift staff to the, to the back gate so that we can get that covered. Or if we need to bring them over to the RVIP entrance, which we do for um, uh, the pregame portion of it, where you get, to some, you get to sit courtside and watch the players warm up, et cetera, do we need to add additional staff there? So it helps us with our staffing metrics to know which gates are most popular for them coming in. Also from a maintenance standpoint, we know which gates to keep a, an eye on to make sure that at the end of the night, everything is still functioning well um, as it was before we opened up because there's heavy use of the doors at those gates. There's heavy use of the ticketing pedestals. We need to make sure that all of that is functional for the next game. Sometimes we have them back to back or we have a game, a concert and a game. So we have to really keep on top of those entry points. Thank you. Um, we often talk about the importance of being able to manage a project. Um, consider you a project manager. Can you explain, explain to our students what is a project manager? What do they do? And, and even what are some of the skills necessary in order to be an effective project manager? So the project manager is the, I would say, the engine behind the actual project because they're the person that has to keep everything in line from the budget to the timeline to the materials used to the the vendors or the contractors that you're using to make sure that the project is um, being fulfilled and staying on top of again the the budget the budget's the main the main thing um, that I learned um, with project managing especially because we have so many projects here at the arena that the department oversees for example one that we uh, did recently before the start of this uh, past season was we updated our lounge on the suite. It used to be called Doer's Lounge and now it's uh, Bacardi Ocho and we completely gutted it. It was a $4 million project and we renovated the whole space. So everything from making sure that the lighting was delivered on time, that we're staying on budget for little things like the artwork because we had a, a painter come in and, and paint one of the walls or we had to get extra decals. Uh, those little nuances making sure Again, we're staying with our $4 million budget and we're not exceeding it because something's gonna have to get left off. Um, ordering the furniture, making sure the furniture arrived, coordinating that aspect because we had furniture coming from Italy, making sure that it, Italy has a time where they take like a summer break, if you will, for all factories, all, all, um, all of their corporate spaces. And we had to time 
the furniture delivery along the lines of Italy being shut down and when we're trying to open the space. Uh, I think one of the important things about being a, a project management manager is you have to be detail oriented and be able to kind of juggle multiple things at one time and, and delegate tasks because you can't handle everything on your own and you want to make sure that you keep everybody that needs to be accountable for the project in line. Thank you. I'm going to talk, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, the Heat are kind of known to be trendsetters in the sustainability space. Um, can you explain to our students what does it mean for a sports arena to be sustainable? Um, and how important is it for a sports team to be known for that? So sustainability is important um, for arenas because we, we take up a large footprint here um, in, in multiple markets. And for us in particular in Miami, we want to make sure that we our building is not being a hindrance to the environment and we're not doing things like something as simple as when we power wash the sidewalks that we're not using chemicals that are going to cause runoff and run into the bay because we're right here by the bay and we don't want to harm the wildlife in the bay. Um, being sustainable is everything from energy uh, to what we're doing environmentally. And here at the arena, we take pride in that in making sure inside the building, we are adhering to the guidelines set forth by USGBC, which governs LEED. And also on the outside of the building, we have drought resistant plants so that we don't have to use excess water to water our plants outside. Again, with the, with the runoff, we make sure there are no chemicals used with our power washing. We regulate our water flow outside. We constantly check for leaks. We're on top of what we can do environmentally um, to reduce our, our carbon footprint here. Um, our garage is, is beneath the arena, which reduces what is called a heat island um, effect, which basically when the cars are parked above ground, you're getting all of those exhaust and those fumes rising into the atmosphere, but with it below ground, that minimizes that significantly. Wow. So with that, I'm going to launch another poll for the students, and it is going to be how many of you knew what LEED certified meant? So most of you did not know, which is great to an extent, right? Because that means after today's session, now you know, and that's a whole um, industry and career. Mm -hmm. It, it is a, a, an industry and a career and one that you can use in many different aspects. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, LEAD is leader in uh, leadership and energy and environmental design. So it encompasses, again, what you do in your building um, and what you do outside of your building. They have different levels. So you can do LEAD as a new construction and make sure that you're gearing your construction to be sustainable and have things like solar panels on your roofs or a beehive on, on the roof, which is one, uh, I think Atlanta has a, a beehive on their, on the roof of their stadium. You can have um, a garden on the roof of your stadium. You can do things that you make sure that you are getting uh, rainwater runoff and recycling that and using that as the water that's, that's uh, a part of what you're consuming inside of your building. Um, and then you can do it as an existing construction, which is what we did. Uh, so the arena was the first sports arena in the U.S. to be certified uh, for LEED when it first, when it, in its inception in 2009. So uh, we take it very seriously here. But there are other aspects. For example, if you worked, uh, there's a if you worked for a, a lighting company, for example, and you're an electrical engineer, you can be a LEED AP, which is a LEED uh, accredited professional and go around and help buildings in their new construction or in their existing construction to become more state sustainable. And you, you go through a credit uh, certification process through USGBC, which is the governing body for LEED, and you get that certification and it, it, it pays. I mean, it is a lucrative career move for you to do as well. And then when people ask you to come in on their new construction and give them pointers or their existing construction and give them pointers, you can charge them a consulting fee. So that's you know, extra additional income that comes in there because we know there's not one path to becoming a millionaire. Multiple streams of income is is important. So that is a, a good career move. Um, myself, I'm a lead green associate, so I have not done the accredited professional course yet, but I did the first the first step of it. Thank you. That's such great information because oftentimes students that care about the environment don't really know what are some of the career options in that space. And you basically mm -hmm. just gave them the, the pathway for that, right? Here is a way that you can go into the space of sustainability 
and still kind of work in sports if, if that's what you you love mm -hmm. um, and that's where your passion lies. Um, we also talked a little bit about the concerts, concerts, right? And some of the events that it, are held at the arena outside of our heat games. Mm -hmm. um, and before we started this call, you were sharing that you have been going a little bit you know, you had a lot going on because there was a big event that you were planning. You want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so uh, we actually have the Latin Grammys that are going to be filmed here. They actually load in this week. Um, uniquely enough, this is going to be a fanless, spectatorless event. So it's a bit different from what we um, typically do. Actually, today is testing day. So everyone's kind of running around getting tested. We're doing on-site testing to make sure that everybody is clear to start working on the 6th when the show actually loads in. Um, and it's been very, it's been a unique challenge to try to navigate how we're going to do this show. In the, in the past, everybody kind of bled together backstage and we're having to separate backstage into zones and making sure that we have COVID monitors to, you know, if your credential doesn't allow you to get into the green zone and you have, and you're coming from the red zone, for example, you'll be stopped there and turned around and made sure that you're staying in your zone, which is very different from how we usually operate backstage. Backstage, our backstage is a circle. So you have free reign within that area on the event level um, once you're here for show production, um, but that's gonna be very different this year, even on down to the talent um, in the building, you know, where most of it will be virtual, people won't be here, but for those that are here, we have to ensure, again, they're staying within the same zones, they've been tested. So it's a very interesting experience and it'll help us for the season whenever that we start so that we understand how to uh, handle people being in the building in that capacity. That's great to know. And, and it kind of leads us to the next section and that is the student questions. And I've, I've been seeing student questions come in and we do have a student question related to what you just mentioned. And the, and the question is from a student named um, Deshwana Richardson. So Deshwana, if you're on, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Okay, it's better now. Yeah. I wanted to know how did COVID-19 impact the sports arena operations due to the games being played in the bubble? Great question. Just wanna, that, that is a good question. Um, so we had a hard shutdown, uh, March, uh, 13th, I think it was, was our D-Day. Everything just collapsed um, when we found out that we had players that tested positive, not with the Heat, but within the league. Um, so once we did restart, we had to restart in phases. And one of the phases was allowing the players to come back and do minimal practices. Um, so we had to set up screening areas, temperature screening areas for the players in the player garage, which actually connects uh, to the building, which makes it easy because we can get them from their cars, screen them, and then allow them access into the building. We uh, set up areas like cool down zones for the players if, for example, one of them was running hot for whatever reason that day. And in, in the early stages of it, we were relying heavily on temperature checks. So if, if somebody was coming in warm, we'd sit them in a cool down zone. We had them staggered for practices to allow for it to be minimal amount of people inside of, um, inside of our practice gym, which is actually located in the arena to minimize the contact and, and be able to enforce social distancing. Once they went to the bubble, we had broadcasters come into the building to broadcast the games from here as they would on a game day because their studio is here, their setup is here. So our challenge then became, how do we create an environment so that we can have media in the building to broadcast and our broadcasters in the control room, which is a closed space and be able to still be safe. So we installed Plexi, up in the control room, the broadcasters had to be socially distanced down uh, courtside as they presented. Everybody was given masks, they had face shields, or they, they would remove these things obviously to be on camera, but off camera, you had to put your mask back on. If you chose to wear a face shield, you had to wear your face shield. Um, we had to ramp up our disinfecting. We have a backpack uh, electrostatic sprayer, which sprays a mist to a mist of disinfectant solution that's hospital grade in all of the areas after the broadcasters left uh, in between takes because they would only do pregame and post. In between that coverage, we'd go disinfect the areas. And then when they come back, they'd come back to a, a sterilized area. Um, we did have equipment managers in the building because the team required like, 
when we change the uniforms, we had to send the uniforms up to them. The guys go through a pair of shoes a game. So we had to send the shoes up to them, but all of that has to be disinfected before we send it up. So they would be here, just, we disinfect it, they pack it up and thankfully it was in Orlando. So we could just, you know, it's a three hour ride, put it in a van and, and get it up there to them. Um, but that was, a, a, that was a unique situation for us game wise because we, we left the court down for the aesthetic, but we had no one in the building. Um, and now we have to figure out going forward because we are in Florida and Florida is wide open for sports and for fans to be in a venue, how do we manage that? Because we can hold 19,000 people in a seated capacity, but do we want 19,000 people in the building and run the risk? So COVID has really changed the scope of how do you fill an, fill an arena? How do you manage the people that are in an arena? And how do you operationally do the things that we need to do to fulfill our contracts with our broadcast uh, broadcasting partners and with the NBA? Wow. Thank you so much. Um, it's incredible how much COVID has impacted so many different industries. This next question is from another student, Aramis Peñate. If you're on, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so the question I have right now are, are arena operations staff usually nervous before games, even though much of their work may be behind the scenes? Uh, knowing that millions of people are watching the game? Hi, Adamis. Uh, that is a good question. I would say the new guys are more nervous. We have a lot of veterans on our operational team and the operations department, uh, as opposed to the engineering department, those guys are hands-on with things like um, picking up the court, putting it down, putting it together, putting in the seats, um, switching our configurations from concerts to games. And there are times where the teams will complain, and this happened last season, say, for example, our basket is not leveled. So when, when they say our basket's not leveled, that can happen uh, pre-game, in the middle of play, during halftime, whatever the case is, and we'd have to have an operations uh, team member come out with a ladder and a leveler to check the level of the basket. And this happens you know, to a packed crowd, in front of a packed crowd, and sometimes it's broadcasted because it could be something that, um, that our partners think is interesting for the fans to see. So I'm sure that their nerves are high um, when they're out there actually checking the, the basket and making sure that it's leveled and you know bringing out the, um, the ladder, et cetera. Um, this was before my time, but there was the time where Shaq broke the backboard and they had to wheel out the new uh, rim during, you know, everyone's in the building, we're, we're live, we're, it's, it's being nationally televised, the cops have to hold everyone back to make sure that we have an, a, a pathway in. Thankfully, that hasn't happened again, because I'm pretty sure everyone's nerves will be high that we, we haven't done that, that drill in a, in a bit. Uh, but I would say the new guys are more nervous to answer your questions, but the, the veterans, you know, they, they, they've done this, they might be nervous now after it's been seven months, eight months since we've last had a game. So we'll see how, how things go once we actually are are live again. That's a great question though. Thank you for answering that. The next question is from a student, Brandon Thompson. Brandon, if you're on, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, hello, good morning. Um, morning, Brandon. Do culinary operations fall under the Department of Sports Arena Operations regarding management of services? That's a good question. No, they do not. We actually have a third party uh, culinary vendor. Our, our um, F&B is Levy. Uh, I, I forgot what their, the full uh, name of the company is, but it is Levy and they actually operate out of uh, Marlins Park as well. They handle all of their, their management in terms of um, their GM, they have their chefs, they have their, 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 H, their own HR. They have their own concessionaire department. They have their own concessions operations uh, manager. They have their own concession staff. So the only interactions that we have with them um, outside of that aspect would be the renovations of their kitchens, ordering their, their equipment for their kitchens, et cetera. So you make sure that we give them the space, but they manage everything in that space. That's a great question. So Levy basically hires their own staff for all the concessions. Yeah at the arena um they build out the different areas and they get to select who goes in right they select who goes in and then they tell us hey we have chick-fil-a coming in here we need to build them a concession stand and then we take over from there nice very interesting 
So I have one more question um, from a student and it's from Jakira Miller. Hi, hello, how are you doing? Hi, Jakira. My question is, what inspired you to work on the sports arena operation? Okay. Jakira's um, audio is a little bit, Hello. Um, her network is a, bandwidth is a little low. So I'm going to repeat it for everyone. What inspired you uh, to work in sports arena operations? Um, I would say what inspired me the most was working shows and, and seeing everything that went on um, backstage to get the dressing rooms ready to build out the stage, to fly the lights, uh, to, to put up the rigging. Um, I thought it was, really interesting from that aspect. And then when I learned again about the digital component, I was all in because I was like, how can I work with tech in while coordinating events? The, the window was very slim, but here I have kind of full reign to do that, so. And we actually have one more question from a student and that's from Giancarlo Franco. Giancarlo, are you on? Yeah, I'm, I'm right here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you lower the camera a little bit so we can actually see your face? There you go. Perfect. Um, my question is, what has been your biggest struggle that has led you to this point of your career? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, what has been my biggest struggle? I think, I can't think of what the, the biggest struggle is, but I think the biggest driver for me to end up at this point in my career with the um, operations and engineering department is the need for, for growth. Um, to be completely candid, growth is something in, in all corporate uh, facets that is difficult. It doesn't come very easily. You'll get in, in positions where you feel kind of stagnated. You know, we all have multiple talents and multiple things that we are good at and we can bring to an organization. But when you are in a specific position, you kind of feel like you're being boxed in or you're reaching your glass ceiling. And one of the things that drives me, like I can't feel like I'm being pigeon held to one thing or I'm only operating in one function or one focus. So that uh, for me was something that I struggled with while I was with the events department because I loved what I did there working with staffing and working the events, but it all becomes mundane after a point in time. Like you can literally do it. Every VIP uh, experience looks the same. Every artist starts to look the same. You know, Drake's walking down the hallway. It's just Drake. You know, you're, I need you to get on the stage because we're trying to go home. We've been here since 6 a.m. So I needed something different and something challenging. Um, and I challenged myself and my, my superiors to allow me to grow. And I, I urge you guys, when you guys start to start your careers, do not be afraid to ask your bosses to challenge you or do not be afraid to speak up for yourself when you're feeling uh, stagnated or you're feeling like you have no room to grow. So, because once you get held there, it's, it's easy to stay. And you look up and it's 10 years later and you're still doing the same thing that you wish that you would have spoke up about earlier. So that's not... I don't know if that probably answers your question in terms of the struggle, but that was one thing that I, I dealt with and that I had to fight against, which is why I ended up um, in this department because I, I, needed, I needed the growth. Thank you. Well, that was some great advice, which leads to our last couple of questions. And, that the, and it's for me actually, mm -hmm. and it's what advice would you give a high school student who aspires to a career in sports? Like what should they be, thinking about studying? What should they be thinking about doing? What should they be working on right now? I would say um, study whatever you want, do whatever your heart desires, honestly, because sports is such a broad uh, industry. I know from the outside looking in, it, it seems like it's just the athletes, the agents, you know, maybe the media people that, that work with the teams or somebody that's working in the equipment room or the coaches or whatever the case is, but it's much broader than that. For example, we have a robust IT department, our business intelligence department that has come up with an analytics software that they're selling to other MBA teams and the MBA itself in order to track their trends for their business and help them to, to become more business conscious and more sustainable in their business aspect in terms of what they're spending money on and what they can kind of reallocate funds uh, to, to make their business grow. Um, we have the, the, the graphics designers that made this uh, graphic that's, that's behind me and they make all of our graphics. They design 
everything from the vice uniforms. They work with the colorway for the vice uniforms. If you are into dance, you can join this organization as a dancer. You can join this organization as the manager of the dancers. Uh, if you're into diversity and inclusion, you can join this organization doing uh, diversity and inclusion. And that, that goes along the lines for all of the sports teams, uh, all of the teams within the NBA. Some leagues are a bit different and pr progress is a bit slow in terms of what you can get into, but the sky's the limit, honestly, and what you want to do. You, go to, you can go to law school. We have two lawyers that work here, our general counsel and our, our associate general counsel that make sure that we are in compliance with everything on down to how we're throwing away the trash right now because of COVID. So there's so many different layers to sports. And I, I would say, don't limit yourself or think that you have to do sports management when you go into, when you're in college. I mean, it, it would be helpful if you decide that you want to go like the facility route or something like that, or sports law because you want to be an agent, but you can literally pick it, pick anything and it can transcend into sport. One final question before we close, and that is if you had the chance to speak with your 17 year old younger self, what advice would you give her? Um, if I could speak to my 17 year old younger self, I would probably, so I played basketball in high school. I probably would be telling myself what I'm telling you guys now that there are other ways in to sports. Like I thought that playing basketball in high school, playing in college, then going into the WNBA and then from the WNBA segueing into a team because for the young ladies on this call, sports on the outside seems like a male dominated industry. I mean, it is majority male, but there are uh, women that are excelling and exceeding expectations within this industry. And when I was 17, I thought that that was gonna have to be my route. Like I had to play in order to get in, but there are many other uh, avenues in. And I wish I would have told myself that or known that uh, sooner because I probably would have not played basketball in college. Not that I don't like playing basketball, but I probably would have dedicated my energies to something else. Thank you. And if we don't have any other questions, if we have, do we have any other questions from the students that are on? I don't see any more coming through. We do not. Jamona, this has been so insightful. Thank you for sharing all this great information about what happens behind the scenes at a sports arena. Oftentimes we go to a concert, we go to a game, we get our food or drink, we sit down and we see all the flashing lights, the music playing, and we get excited, but we have no idea everything that happens. I do have a question. How many employees work behind the scene at the AAA? So on a day-to-day, -day, we are, for the Heat Group, um, which is the all-encompassing company. So the Heat the, the county owns this building, but the Heat run it. Um, so with the Heat group, we have about 500 employees that are full-time. Um, on an event day, maybe we have 1,500 to 2,000 employees in here. Once, once we get down to the nitty gritty of Levy's staff, our security staff, security is also uh, outsourced. We have a third party company, CSC, uh, that does our security. Once we have our full guest services uh, count in here, it's about 250 people just for event staff alone. So if you come here and we're playing the Lakers and we're a full building, there are 20, 250 people that are either going from taking your ticket to checking your ticket as you come into the, the vomitory to go to your seats. Um, so yeah, it, there's a, a big number. But the, the thing is, a lot of the full-time staff do not work, um, do not have game duties. So they're, they're gone for game days. Got it. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. I hope, I know that our students from the three um, school districts that joined us today, Miami, Dade, Broward, and Orange County, all the way in Orlando, um, Central Florida area, um, are grateful for, for your time and appreciate you sharing um, a little bit about what happens behind the scenes at the AAA. On behalf of NAF. Thanks for your time as well. <laughs> on behalf of NAF, thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Everybody have a good day.